I went and I harassed some of the biggest names in game development content creation in order to gather the best advice, the best habits for making games. And you can trust me when I tell you that these are the pros. Yes. I designed the original Fruit Ninja. Cooking up today, we've got technical tips, tips about the process, balance, organization, how to know what decisions to make for your game, all in one video from the pros. Now, as a game developer, <clears throat> learning how to handle feedback is super important. Whoa, was that Aya? YouTuber and developer of open world RPG, Man of Alley? Players don't always understand the game's design, so their feedback often comes out as suggestions that may not be the best fix. It's your job to find the real problem behind what they're saying and solve it in a way that fits your vision. In my game, Man of Alley, players asked for health and mana regeneration. I wanted potions to feel meaningful, so I didn't want to add regeneration all the time. Instead, I created a system where players slowly heal if they've been out of combat for 30 seconds. This made exploration smoother while keeping potions important in battle. Now that advice is something that you'd maybe usually think of with live service games and the fun task that must be balancing a game for thousands of players with different skill sets and opinions. Yeah, well, that also applies to single player or small projects, like Aya said. Say that you're working on a platforming game and everyone who plays this platformer is telling you, hey, the movement feels really clunky, you should make the character faster. It might be completely true that the character is clunky and that's good feedback, but maybe it isn't the speed that's the problem. Maybe there's too much or too little friction. Maybe gravity needs to go up or down a little bit, or it's some other hidden modifier that anyone who hasn't seen the guts of your game would even think to suggest. Playtesters and friends can be great for identifying problems, but that doesn't mean that they'll give you the best solutions. Sorry, hang on a second. Is that Fruit Ninja? Yeah. Well, the designer of that game and Jetpack Joyride is Luke Muscat, who I had the privilege of meeting at Open Source this year. And he has some of the best, wisest advice that comes from making games professionally for over 18 years. One really easy <clears throat> habit, which I think makes a huge difference. Yes, hello, mate. Yes, you get pets too. Is to make a to-do list at the end of every day. So the very last thing you do is make a to-do list for the next day. It doesn't need to be everything you're gonna do that next day. It's just something to get you started. It's pretty easy to be overwhelmed. Like there's so many different things to do. What should I start on? Maybe there's this big task I've been putting off. If you've got a to-do list and it's got something like nice and short and easy at the beginning, especially to knock off, it really makes a big difference. Luke also talks about a more technical habit that he picked up at Half Brick Studios called tool timing. When you're trying to tune a variable, instead of like just changing it a tiny bit and trying to see what happens, start off by making a huge change. Make it 10 times, 100 times bigger than you think it should be, just to make sure that changing it is having the impact that you would expect. You're essentially gonna blow it up, but at least you know you're tweaking the right thing. But the biggest and most important tip that Luke had was to show your game to as many people as possible, even if it isn't anywhere near being done. It's incredibly easy to be like, well, it's not ready, or I know it's not fun yet. Those are all excuses. Get people to play your game as much as possible at all times, because the later you leave showing the game, the easier it is to be like, well, now it's too late to change things. I've put so much work in, it's gonna cost heaps to make those changes. Do not let your game be in the darkness. This is also something that Mark Brown from GMTK talked about when he was developing Mind Over Magnet. In one of the videos, he talks about how it's kind of hard to let people into the creative process and not the grand finished product that you want the world to see. But still, it's such an important part of the process and it lets you make the best game possible. All of the game development classes that I've taken through university so far have all emphasized playtesting, especially in the early stages. The only way that you know your game is fun is by going and seeing if it's fun. In my classes, we would start testing almost as soon as you have the core gameplay established, even if it looks hideous, to test whether that main gameplay loop is actually gonna work and whether it's actually fun. But our next advice comes from Good Giz, my favorite YouTuber, sorry, a, an okay YouTuber and developer of this this game called Dewdrop Dynasty. I guess, it's cool, I guess. It's fine, no big deal. Good Giz suggests that you try <clears throat> marrying your game. It's so easy to stop working on a project or start making something new when you're not committed to your game. When you're in the prototyping phase or if you're just learning, of course it's important to try some new ideas and keep moving on. But once you decide on your game, 
just stick with it. There are so many skills that you'll learn just by finishing a game that you'll never encounter if you just keep abandoning your projects. I've never regretted finishing a project, and I don't think you will either. So just remember, anytime you start getting a little crush on another game idea, remind yourself that you made a commitment. So go out there, get a ring, and uh, marry your game. Also, I mean like metaphorically. Please don't like literally marry your game. That would be, that'd be weird. Like Good Giz emphasized, it's not bad to experiment and try out new stuff when you're first starting, but even with the small projects, finish those small projects. Get to a point where you're actually adding polish and adding the final steps to get the satisfaction, the reward, and the motivation that makes you want to go make more games. Man, really good advice so far, but it can be easy for it to start to feel overwhelming. And if it's too much to manage, then know that there are tools out there made to help you. You don't, you don't have to do it all yourself. Especially when it comes to implementing more complex features like in-game shops, that's where a platform like Exola can help, who I do thank for partnering with me on today's video. When you hit a certain step of the process, like monetization, it can feel like a roadblock. Because now you're not just building your game, but you're thinking about, okay, how do I actually process payments? Not to forget about platform fees and restrictions, handling fraud, customer service, making sure it's available everywhere. It's a lot. Well, Exola Webshop handles all of that for you, since it's a tool that lets you create a custom online storefront for your game. And it helps you set that up in a way that isn't gonna take advantage of your players or exploit them. We all, we all know I'm really passionate about that because you have full control and customization the entire time on how you want your shop to function and look. And along the way, you'll get to keep up to 95% of your revenue because most major platforms will take like 15 to 30%. These are the kind of systems that usually only AAA studios can afford to have. And this is all without you needing to do any code so you can focus on making your game. So check out Exola's website today by visiting the link in the description. It could be the most time-saving decision that you make for your game. Thank you, Exola, for sponsoring, and let's move on to the next tip. Our next piece of advice comes from Chalicade, another, you know, okay YouTuber that I definitely haven't followed for years. And he's developing the game Moonshire. And his advice is keeping all of my development progress backed up online. All of my artwork is stored in cloud drives, and I'm a really big fan of using version control systems like Git to manage all of my projects. Having version control is amazing because it tracks every individual change to your files. All of your progress stays organized, and you can revert any changes or jump between branches to test out different updates. But the main benefit of this habit is having a backup if something goes wrong. Like, if you've never had a hard drive crash on you before, it really is horrible to lose data, especially with something creative like making a game. In case you've never used Git or version control, I'm gonna show you how to do it in like 60 seconds using GitHub Desktop and Godot as an example, just because it's that important. First, you're gonna install GitHub Desktop and then you're gonna log into your GitHub account. Click File, then New Repository. Give it a name and then enter the path that your game is currently in. In Godot, you can grab this super easily, just right click your res folder and then copy absolute path. Set your Git ignore to Godot and then press Create Repository. Up here, press Publish Repository, Publish. And now if you right click your repository name at the top left and click Show in Explorer, this is where your repository lives. So if you go back one folder, you'll find all of your game files. So you wanna drag those into your repository. If you go back to GitHub Desktop, you'll see that all these changes have been made, which means you've successfully moved everything into your new repository. We're gonna push all of this to GitHub. So we're gonna give it a commit message and then press commit. So commit that and then push your changes with this button up at the top. And now if you log into GitHub on any device, or if you go to the website, you will have the updated version version of your project. You can easily go back to previous versions of your game with this history tab or disregard any changes that you've currently made. Just try and be smart about when you commit and what you name them so that you know what you're going to go back to. There is so much more that you can do with Git. There's branches, you can work with other people, you'll probably use it in almost any development job. So if you want to read up on Git and everything else that's really involved, I'll put the link in the description. But you don't just want to keep your code organized, you also want to keep your ideas organized. A lot of people will keep notes in order to keep track of everything thing in their game. But keep in mind that even a good habit like note taking can become a bad one if you get a little too obsessive about it. Because your ideas might feel perfect on paper, but it's really hard to tell if a game mechanic is fun until you implement and test it. I think it's a better habit to spend time developing things, trying out your ideas, and writing notes along the way. Since I'm constantly learning new things and coming up with fresh ideas, I like to take an organized chaos approach to all this. I have these notebooks, and I also have 
have a bunch of online documents too. So from someone else's perspective, it might look like I have no structure at all. But it's sort of like when you have a messy bedroom and you're still able to remember exactly where everything's at. Instead of spending time organizing, I'm able to focus on development and then I'll just clean things up if I need to collaborate with someone. Beautiful, beautiful advice, because i am that's something that I need to work on. I love ideation, but there's also a reason why everyone likes to be the ideas guy. Because kind of like Luke was saying earlier, the best move can just be to come up with a core feature, implement it, and then dive into the weeds with note taking. But something that content creator and my friend, Sondering Emily, focuses on while working on her game, Lily's World XD, wishlist it now on Steam, is to continually ask yourself, mm -hmm, is this feature supporting the message or theme of my game? Lily's World XD is a horror game, so you'd expect scary monsters, jump scares, maybe paranormal elements. Yet my game doesn't incorporate those things. It's about investigating a teenage girl's computer and the unsettling, invasive feeling of looking at something you shouldn't be. Everything in my game needs to reinforce that. Genre can be helpful in guiding your design, but keeping your theme in mind saves time and makes your game more focused. The next time you make a platformer, ask yourself, does this really need a double jump or dash? Thank you so much, Emily. That's that's really good advice. This is something that I think is useful to almost anything creative because from all the game analysis I've done on this channel of really niche things, I feel like I can conclude that usually the best design is the most intentional design. Even when it comes to things like font or user interface, does this fit the feeling or the atmosphere of my game? Does the character move in a way that coincides with their characterization? Am I adding combat to my RPG game because I think an RPG game should have combat? or because it makes sense with the experience that I want to give the player. And if you don't know, then maybe it's time to identify what that player experience is. Like what adjectives can I use to describe the atmosphere of my game? And how can every feature or design choice enhance that? Unifying all the decisions that go into the design of your game is gonna make it more cohesive, it's gonna make the narrative stand out more, it's just, it's a plus. But when it comes to more technical advice, my friend Jordan Carter, who is the developer of this sushi deck builder, Choppy Waters, suggests that you should try writing clean code or at least writing cleaner code than they did the day previously. The reality is you do not need clean code to release a great game. There are lots of examples out there of games that have extremely messy code bases and they're incredible, but the cleaner your code is, the more capable you are of adding content. After playtesting, I had like 50 plus ideas for new abilities that I wanted to add to the game. You know, it probably would have taken me the same amount of time to add those abilities and debug all the problems that inevitably would have been there, or I could spend that time refactoring my ability system, making it more data-driven, making it more extendable, and end up putting the same amount of time in as I would have just trying to add the ability straight up. Prioritize cleaning up code that will result in you being able to add more content to your game more quickly. I think that's when it really matters. Clean code as a concept can mean a lot of different things at a lot of different levels. At a base level, it means that your code is easy to read, understand, and maintain. Which means you gotta keep some things consistent, like styling, spacing, variable names, references, that kind of stuff that's usually more intuitive. It also means separating logic where it makes sense to, and keeping components in your game smaller and focused. Like, can you break down something in your code to be smaller and then reusable? But like Jordan was saying, the biggest thing that clean code is good for is that when you need to add or change a feature, you don't have to rewrite all of your code. I've learned that looking at other people's code who do know what they're doing is a pretty good way to learn it, but there's so much information online if you really want to dive deep into this advice. Anyway, uh, wait a minute. Uh, are you still playing Fruit Ninja? A huge thank you to all of the content creators who joined me for making this video. All of their games and all of their information is going to be linked in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Bye bye!